And I think we're live. This is so much harder oh, yeah. when we, yeah, we so much harder when we don't have Randy here to coordinate all the clicking, clicking of the buttons. You know what I mean? That is true. Randy's, you know, we, we give him some bad, some bad press once in a while, but cause, cause he is bad, but I mean, still. So hey, a pair of hands are better than none. Right. So, I mean, that's right. I had to talk to Randy about up in his hours or something like that. Welcome everybody. How's everybody doing? I see a bunch of stuff flying by in the chat. Thank you for being here. Uh, tonight we're going to do a live stream and we're going to talk about uh, antennas for your ham radio adventures. And speaking of ham radio adventures, I brought my buddy Chuck on because whenever I've got any questions about antennas or I'm thinking about antenna stuff, I always run a past Chuck because he is, uh, he's the guru. Well, what I do, do the same. <laughs> Hey, I was just glad to be here tonight, and uh, yeah, I, I love talking about antennas, and when Jim's on the show, we can't, because he, he doesn't see the use of an antenna, I guess, I don't know. Wait, He might be in the thing, watch out. He would prefer um, to go antennaless. Yes, as soon as they come up with a radio that doesn't need an antenna, Jim's buying five of them. <laughs> right, he's going to be, he's camping, he's camping out at be the in his, That's right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, people spend so much money on on radios and all the other stuff, and it's like if you if you have a really terrible antenna, it doesn't matter what radio you have. <laughs> Wait, there's I mean, the um, there's a meme where the guy's like on the phone and he's in a hotel and he says, "I like a wake up call," and then the lady at the desk says, "You have a, you have a two thousand dollar radio and an NFED half wave mounted six feet off the ground." You know, <laughs> meaning right? That, uh, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to get any contacts or anything like that. But uh, today we wanted to talk about the top five uh, mistakes that you see in amateur radio when it comes to antennas. So we got a lot of stuff to cover. And uh, what we decided to do is put together a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation because that's what I like to do. And uh, I'll pull that up in one second. But uh, we got we got a bunch of stuff in the chat. I, so I let's just take care of that. wife. And she laughed. We are not little. going to talk about ham sticks, Cliff. Ham sticks are off limit tonight. <clears throat> yeah, there's well, there is a wire in ham sticks, but uh, here we go. Look at this, it. Don. Don built Don, something using your instructions. That half square, that thing's it was pretty good. It works. I forgot it. it's all rolled up right there someplace um, in the toolbox. I should and throw it in my uh, uh, my stuff, but bike it wart. I don't know how you say that, so apologize in advance. He says he just needs a G90 and a good antenna. What I can tell you is a G90 and a good antenna is better than a G90 and a bad antenna. That I know for sure. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. There's a lot of good antennas out there that could. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Cliff. Appreciate it. Will. So um, I think it was thanks, Cliff, Cliff posted in the Discord that uh, he was using a ham stick for on 10 meters. And one of the things I'll say is, is that, so let's just say a ham stick six feet long. I don't know how long they are, but let's say it's six feet. That's a it's a one. lot less of a compromise on 10 meters than it is on 40 or 80 or any of that stuff, because it's still longer. It the ratio the, is there. The loading. Right. Have right. Loading. Yeah. Cause all those ham sticks are about, I know I've got, um, I've got a bunch of them. Uh, I've got, I've got the, uh, the, what's the, uh, the ones with the, that are center loaded. I think they actually work a little better personally. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't drive down the road with one though, because it's because of that center load. So, and plus all mine are the higher output ones that you, I think you can do. They're big and porky. Yeah, no, the center loading ones do, do work, 500. work better. And then our friend Liberty they'll... Cave, he is a, uh, he's correct. A G90 and a good antenna is better than flex and a bad one. We would agree with you. And Mark, yeah. we are going to talk about coax. That's one of the things on the list. It is on the list. I saw it. I've seen I've seen the PowerPoint guys. I, I brought that up to my wife. I go, we're doing PowerPoint. She's like, oh, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't. She goes, I hardly believe that. <laughs> well, I ran the PowerPoint past Chuck to make sure it was technically accurate. He, he said it was oh, I, okay. re I read most of it. It looked good. So here it is. Let's add it to the stage, and uh, we'll start talking about some of this <clears throat> stuff. And... Excuse me. So I put some language in here just to kind of set the scene and uh, I'll read through crucial. a little bit, talk about it. So I said an amateur radio antennas are often considered the most crucial part of any radio installation. And I think we just covered that when we were talking a little bit about the G90 and the good antenna. Careful consideration on what antenna to deploy is critical for successful communications. So the main thing that I wanted to cover here is some antennas work, some work 
well and some work extremely well. And it's important to understand the difference. And so that's what a lot of times we'll talk about, well, hey, I put this antenna up and it works. Well, right, sure. I mean, we've seen people make contacts on all kinds of craziest stuff on uh, the will it antenna night. But if you really want to maximize your range of communication, the quality of communications, your signal strength, both in and out of your radio, better antennas will help you do that better. So understanding the characteristics of your antenna and how it should be used and some theory behind its operation will have a tremendous impact on your ability to have successful communications. Amateur radio takes advantage of many different allocated frequency ranges. So you can go way, way high up in the gigahertz all the way down to uh, pretty low, I guess, if you want to talk about 200 or 2,200 meters, but uh, even just down to what we call top band at 160. Also, we use different modes of communication and we can employ various power levels. So certain things like duty cycle or duty factor can impact the antenna that you want to use because if you're doing impedance transformation in the antenna, sometimes your cores can get hot and cause you problems. Also, you have QRP antennas that are very thin wire, very small transformers, small chokes. You don't want to run 1500 watts or a gallon through that stuff. Thank you very much, Don. Hey, it thanks, is Don. much appreciated. Merry Christmas to you. So I said that there are a myriad of different types and styles of antennas, ranging from very simple to extraordinarily complex. Many manufacturers produce and sell antennas to meet the needs of amateur radio operators, and many of them make outlandish claims about performance, quality, and innovation. So you'll see antenna manufacturers that'll have a little box, and they'll be like, inside this box is a magical transformer that is flat SWR from 160 all the way to 2 meters. It'll do X, Y, and Z, and it'll last in the rain, survive a nuclear blast, whatever. And then also say that, you know, you'll get better contacts and it adds 50 dB of gain and all this other stuff. But most of what these antenna manufacturers is, say is a bunch of hogwash. And I, I don't believe any of it them, is. to be honest with It you. is. Like that that uh, CB antenna, it was, what was it, like 19 dB gain or something like that for vertical? Right. Like, no, no possible way. Yeah, so it's not, as you, it's, not as, it's not as bad in the ham world as it is in the CB world, though. Right. And so as you gain more experience and more familiarity with different antenna types and you use them and stuff like that, you'll learn that some of the stuff is true and some of the stuff is fake and you'll be able to identify it. And again, th they're selling <laughs> the antennas to make money because they're a business. So I would take anything with a grain of salt. It's just like anybody selling cars or, or loan or whatever. You know what I mean? Like people are going to say that this is going to get you more, whatever you wouldn't get if you buy it. We got a question here from Joe. You want to check this out real quick? Yeah, you got it. He's, I have an offset. He's, I have an OCF dipole, off center fed dipole, guys, about 30 feet up in the tree in an inverted uh, V. I run an IC729 in external ATU. Does it make sense for the SWR to change a tiny bit day to day? Um, it can. I mean, I, I run a doublet, and when it rains, um, I, I only use the 300 ohm stuff and it changes a lot. I mean, I'm constantly, it's the only thing I don't like about the doublet and I can fix that with better ladder line, but, um, it can change a little bit, I guess. I don't know. You should be, you should, yeah. depending on the band you're on, you shouldn't have to tune it much, if any, really. Well, one of the things, and we do talk about this in the presentation <laughs> that, uh, I'll say is, is that if you have, um, a choke on there, you're better protected than if you don't. So with an all center fed dipole, it's a good idea to put a, a trans, a balance choke at the antenna feed point and a balance choke at the shack output or shack input. That way you're minimizing any RFI currents that you're getting on your outer shield. So your neighbor could fire up their, uh, I don't know, koi pond pump, fire up solar panel stuff. And that puts RF out. And if that RF makes its way into your antenna's range or near field, what can happen is, is that will uh, your your coaxial cable can pick that up and add currents to the outer shield of your transmission line. And when that happens, your your SWR readings will go a little wonky. And sometimes sometimes your SWR will change just with the wind and stuff. Just your antenna moving. Sometimes I, I don't know how you're how you're telling it's moving, or just because you have to retune it. I don't. I don't know exactly yeah. what you're talking about but also i've seen like where an antenna wire will get hot in the sunlight of the day and it'll actually a little bit get a little bit longer and if it's colder it can shorten a little bit 
also if you have any connection points that Oops. are maybe not waterproof so like you might have moisture inside your coaxial cable connector and that can cause you a little bit of a little bit of grief too a lie detector yeah. antennas back to back comparisons yep well you should watch my uh does it let's see what was it uh um I, I, I tested the dipole against a, uh, a very well-known antenna, and it, it for, for as much as that thing costs, right. it didn't do very well. You have to look yeah. that one up. I think it's, just think of a famous antenna out there, and it's <laughs> overpriced. Um, like we got Liber Liberty Liberty Cave. Thank you for the super chat, LC. Uh, he says marketers talk <laughs> about antenna gain, antenna books talk about takeoff angles, and he ain't lying. Yep. And neither is Mike by saying ABC always be choking. That's what we always say. Choke every wire you got. Um, short timer tonight, but he'll catch up later on team replay. There's lots of people Mike. using that. Uh, a lot of people using that ABC now. We did. Yeah, we had something thanks. different in the fire service, but uh, I'm pretty well, sure Ape brought that one up first before anybody else. Well, one of my favorite now. scenes in movies, and it's a terrible movie, is Boiler Room. And they're talking about, I think it was Boiler Room. Anyhow, they're talking about always be closing because they're sales guys. And they're saying that whenever, from the second you make a contact with a potential customer until the, until the sign is on the dotted line, always be closing and every everything. So that's kind of where it came from, always be joking. And then we started saying oh, ABC always be counterpoising. Um. In this slide, what I was saying is, is that many amateur radio operators choose to, choose to build their own antennas from well-known designs, often making adaptations for their particular needs. And that's awesome because it drives innovation through experimentation. So a lot of people talk about amateur radio is about experimentation. This is a perfect example of that. And then I said there's also a variety of antenna kits available for hams to DIY. They provide projects that provide amateur radio operators the opportunity to learn antenna construction techniques and antenna theory. And that's really important because even if you do buy antennas, expensive ones, you're going to have problems with them. And often when you get those antennas, you need to tune them and you need to mount them correctly. And so that's where some of that construction technique and antenna theory meet up. So let's get on with the actual mistakes that people make. So the first one we have here is that um, antennas that are incorrectly installed. And this can be a problem when things are assembly assembled incorrectly. It's so like a lot of times you get an antenna and you have to connect radials or elements, or you have to connect the element and a counterpoise. And sometimes folks will mix up where they connect or they'll you they'll put uh, like, if you have a directional antenna, a reflector in the wrong space where maybe the director should go. And that can cause you grief and problems. So one of the things like people will reach out to us and they'll say, Hey, my antenna's not working the way it should. Can you help us out? And the first thing we say is send us some pictures of it. Right. And we'll take, we'll take a look at it and make sure that everything is assembled correctly before you do any other troubleshooting. The other one is, is a lot of times folks won't use the recommended components and a perfect example of this is the counterpoise. So I saw a video where somebody got out an antenna. It was a toy box antenna. And they set it up and they actually made some FTA contacts, which is pretty easy to do with a pretty bad antenna because FTA is so good at, at, at reading signals in like a low signal environment. And they didn't hook a counterpoise to the antenna, which is in the instruction manual for something that you absolutely should do. And I don't remember what they said, why they did or they, did, they didn't do it. But <clears throat> a lot of folks say, oh, I'm not going to use the counterpoise. I'm just going to let the shield be the counterpoise. <clears throat> and that's where you get RFI problems, like we talked about earlier in the video. And what can happen there is that the shield of your, of your transmission line, your coaxial cable, will actually pick up noise and sometimes will even radiate noise. And it becomes part of your antenna itself as, 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 a, uh, as an element. And that noise can come into your ham shack and cause all kinds of problems or havoc. So it's a really good idea to put a counterpoise on, even if the antenna doesn't recommend it. Right. And you need to, <clears throat> you do need to uh, choke that anyhow. If you are using your coax, you don't want it to come all the way. Right. Right. I was watching something thing, uh, oh, right. the other day and the guy, he was saying two meters and, uh, it, but put a choke at two meters. Actually, I'd, I'd probably go like three, around 10 feet. Yeah. Throw a choke. I, I just choke right at the feed point and, you, and do the counter. That's counter what I noise. usually do too. But I mean, if you did want to use it, that's a way of doing it. <clears throat> but sorry to interrupt there. I'm trying now to we got questions. Um, but. I'm not sure 100% how to pronounce this, but it looks like Salayuma 
And um, they use the ARRL antenna book as a guideline and mm -hmm. improvise along the way. And that is fantastic. They, one thing the league does great, probably the best thing that they do, is produce a lot of good quality documentation and manuals and uh, reference material for amateur radio operators. It's, they, they do a great job with that. The next thing we have is in terms of antennas that are incorrectly installed is the incorrect height. So a lot of times uh, folks will have an antenna that is mounted really, really low and it's acting more of an NVIS type configuration as opposed to uh, at the right height where they might be able to make DX contacts and they wonder, I can only get out 300 miles. I don't know what's going on here. So in a lot of those cases, what we'll recommend is that um, Let's take a look at your antenna, the type of antenna, the area where you're going to be mounting your antenna and what kind of structure you have available and look for opportunities to get that mounted as by the book as we can. Right. <clears throat> you're, not, you're, not gonna, you're not going to get okay. an 80 meter dipole at the correct height. No. I mean, no, most people can't do that. No, but you not. get as close as you, I mean, get as high as you can get it usually is the best thing, but Yeah. Yeah, and our buddy Hamstick Eric, how you doing, Eric? He said he's heard a bunch of people say hey, they need to use 100 feet of coax cable to correct that, and they don't realize they're just hiding a problem with line loss when a choke would have had it fixed. 100%. The other thing is they're losing <clears throat> loss on the way to, they're losing uh, power on the way to the antenna. And then once that uh, SWR curve comes back, they're losing the SWR reading through attenuation in the reverse direction and thinking that their antenna is matched to their transmission line when it's not. Right. Uh, what we have here is no environmental environmental mitigation. And what we're talking about is use, using like self-amalgamating electrical tape around your coaxial connections to prohibit wa water or moisture wicking into mm -hmm. your coaxial cable and causing problems or even UV <clears throat> protection. So a lot of times folks will, so, I, I was guilty of this one. I hooked up an antenna and I used a zip tie around the insulator and the zip tie wasn't a UV protected zip tie and oh. it, you know, dried out and snapped and my antenna was laying in the yard. So I learned how to do mine from uh, Gary um, from the discord there. And he, he said the, um, do the amalgamated or whatever, you, how you call that tape first right. and then go over the top of that with um, just regular, good electrical tape on top of that to protect the, the other, I guess it's not as UV resistant maybe, or it's more susceptible probably to heat and stuff. And I did all mine that way, and well, actually, all my runs where I did that was at my at my tower, where because I at the tower where it, where it turns, I put more mm -hmm. flexible four hundred up there, and then from there on, I used uh, it was it was stranded four hundred, but it, from uh, I bought like a five hundred foot roll and just made single pieces all the way to the house. But anything that was outside, that was it was done that way. And then uh, we got Doc Brad over here. He's saying, evening, boys. There good antenna and right deployment evening. makes any room good. Thank you, Doc. Much appreciated. Our good friend Liberty <clears throat> Cave. He's saying Vaseline is a fantastic waterproofing material. Look, I mm -hmm. don't know what kind of stuff he's got going on over there, but he does like to grease it up. <laughs> just be, <laughs> just, just be mindful around that cave. I think he's talking about putting some on the threads, so it doesn't uh, up the threads. Okay. Not, not what you were thinking. The next thing we have on here is poor structural components like mass skylines, hardware, and insulators. And so where this becomes a little bit of a challenge is that, you know, you want to make sure you have this that is properly guide out and mm -hmm. is sturdy because you don't want things like wind blowing it around or blowing <clears> it down. You want to make sure that your mast is constructed out of a material that's not going to interfere with your antenna. And you want to make sure that it's going to withstand weather. For guy lines, yeah. a lot of times folks will just use cheap twine cord or something along those lines. There's a Daycron rope that's really, really popular. Mm -hmm. um, I use uh, bank line for fishing. It's tarred and it's got a 400 pound rating on it. It works really well. But also for my guy lines, I use uh, like a kayaking bungee cord. They put it on kayaks to bungee cord your gear down. You can buy specified lanes, like 25 feet of it off of Amazon. And I put a little bit of that towards the end. And what it allows it to do is it, if you do have movement in your antenna system, what will happen is, is that that bungee cord will stretch and then it'll pull it back to where it rests. So that way, if you have prolonged winds or something like that, you don't have to worry about any kind of damage or anything snapping. 
in terms of hardware, Chuck, you were the one that, you know, you're always professing stainless steel right over like zinc. Yeah, you want to use stainless steel. I mean, you, if it's something that's going to stay outside all the time, especially if, if you're just taking it out here and there on portable stuff, you can get by with zinc stuff. But um, I always, I just buy off of Amazon a lot of times, I'll just buy like a little box. And that's how we, we buy our, our screws for the, uh, for the antenna kits. They're all stainless okay. steel. It may not be the the like the best stainless steel you could buy from someplace, but then we don't charge that way either. So, but with mast, Lynn, you were talking about the correct material. I know, I know, Don likes his uh, his carbon fiber mast, but do not if you're going to use a vertical antenna. There's a reason the DX Commander doesn't use carbon fiber. It will totally change your links and stuff. So if you are going to use it, you have to get it away from the pole that that mast a little ways at least if you're going to do a vertical. Because because it it drove me crazy one day and I didn't even realize I was using one. The one I was I'm like oh yeah they you know the cheap Chinese one they always say it's carbon fiber well, I guess this one actually was. And my length was like I think I want to say it was half the length of a, that I should have had for the wire and I was like what is going on here you know never had that problem before. Yeah, and then I have um, insulators on here. So a lot, a lot of times, what you want to make sure that you're doing is that when you're insulating, maybe guy lines, <laughs> or you're insulating uh, an antenna element connections to like a metal fence, for example, you want to make sure that you're using non-conductive material. Like Teflon is a perfect example. And I think in the old days they used to use ceramic insulators, but uh, they're a little heavy and they're kind of expensive. But you want to make sure that you get a non-conductive insulator that is UV resistant. So that way you don't have to worry about replacing it or doing any of that kind of work. I mean, you could go as cheap as just getting some nice heavy duty wire ties that are UV resistant. That's, that'll work. I mean, I've, yeah, I've, I've, like I, I said, I'm I do so for a lot of stuff. Of, I'm so guilty of using like a zip ties that are not UV resistant. Yeah. Here well, we go. We got say it. Are they, <laughs> you know, we have the oh, broken the stuff right branch. There. Thank you very much. And he says he uses a yeah. 3M type 23 rubberized tape and then covers it with a good electrical tape. He's taping it twice. Uh, this way, if you need to get back to the coax, the mastic, uh, mastic tape is. Yeah, you're totally right. Like once, once you. <laughs> sometimes it's oh, I use the thirty. It. I use the thirty-three. It's this. It got the yellow inside. Rubber made. Uh, well, three. now now that you mentioned oh, it, this Chuck, is Scotch. Excuse me. Yeah, there's it, there's a lot of difference between like a good three M or Scotch electrical tape and then Harbor mm -hmm. Freight electrical tape, right? I'll use the Harbor Freight stuff a lot of times for going out and building it because I'll tape it up, you know, and then I'll just to waste or I'll throw it in my thing for the, you know, for day use and stuff like that. This stuff here, though, will get a little gummy when you yeah. take it off. But I've never seen any tape before that you could, you, you know how you wrap it around and you break it and mm -hmm. push over it. You can't find the thing when you're done. It's like almost impossible to find the end of it sometimes. That part I don't like sometimes. So I bend them over. A good friend, the, Hollywood. Uh, the tape that is. He's saying ceramic and Pyrex are the best insulators. Yeah. And then uh, Liberty Cave saying that John Portune has recently started talking about plastics that are ni not nice to RF. It's worth looking him up. And um, certain types of PVC can not uh, play nice with RF. And um, John Portune, he fantastic ham, extremely knowledgeable. I love watching any of his content. He's the, the, the slot antenna slot, guy. Slot antenna yeah. guy, yeah. And uh, the butter, I think it's a butterfly antenna or something like that. Um, he does a couple of those things. And then before we go to the next slide, let's say thank you to Dean. Hey, Much appreciated. Dean. All right. Awesome. We'll so the next performance. Yeah. The next thing Sorry. we see a lot of times, man, you're a good man. A lot of times is folks who actually don't tune their antenna. And they'll buy, they'll buy an antenna off the shelf or over the internet. And then just go hang it up and set it up and, and start start working on it. And they might not be aware that you have to tune the antenna. So at a minimum, everybody should have a decent SWR meter that you can use to at least be able to find out what your impedance ratio is if you have to lengthen or shorten your antenna. Um, you can get a little bit more advanced things with like a Nano VNA or a Rig Expert or, or um, I think Comet, the one that you use. Where you can actually read plots or, or of a sweep of signals across a variety of frequencies to understand mm -hmm. how the impedance changes with the change in frequency. And then you can also look at what makes up that impedance, whether it's inductive or capacitive reactance and make antenna changes there. That's starting to get a little bit more complicated. 
But at a minimum, you want to look at a range of frequencies and then where your lowest SWR is. And then if you need to lengthen or shorten your antenna to at least make sure that you have a match between your radio transmission line and antenna. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you could any kind of decent, you can do it with an SW, SWR meter too, guys. You don't, I mean, you can do it on your radio half the time if you're, it just you takes can. longer. It just takes longer. I showed that on a video one time on how to tune a, I think if you look up 20 meter antenna, if you look at that video that I did, I show how you actually, if you don't know how you guys, most of you guys probably know it anyhow, but you can use it. It just, it just takes longer than, than having a, like a rig expert or nano VNA. Yeah. I think of the nicer uh, antenna analyzers, not, a, they're not really an SWR meter at that range. It's an automation tool to make the <laughs> diagnosis of your antenna a little bit easier. I, mean, I, I know immediately what I got to do to it now. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to necessarily you know, run through all this stuff, but I mean, if you don't tune your antenna, you get poor performance and signal loss. A lot of times your antenna will be resonant on frequencies other than the one that you're operating on, so it's going to make sending and receiving signals difficult. Not tuning your antenna raises your um, SWR, and when that happens, one of the things that can happen is your radio will actually fold back to protect itself. So you might think that you're transmitting a certain amount of wattage, but your radio is dialing that back and you're not. Even worst case scenario, your radio could de become damaged by the reflected power coming back in. Um, and then you're obviously suffering power loss from what you think you're transmitting versus what you actually are. All right. And well, 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 the cat drug in somebody named FEP Labs Radio. How you doing, Jim? What? Hopefully he didn't see the beginning of the video where we made fun of him a little bit. Well, you really yeah, did it, not yeah, me. Yeah, It was just, it was, it was me? It wasn't me. I forget what I, I, forget what I said now. <laughs> oh yeah something about not like an antennas that's what it was yeah so the next thing we have on here for mistakes that uh are made with antennas and amateur radio is not using a cmc or an rfi choke and what i put on here a lot of times you'll see people be like ain't no such thing as cmc ain't no such thing as rfi i can't see it i can't measure it i can't smell it and i can't taste it and what i'm here to tell you is is that it's real and it's bad and what we don't want is RFI or common mode currents coming into our ham shack. So when you think about the transmission of a signal from an amateur radio, it is using AC current or differential mode current, which is equal and opposing. So you have a certain amount of current going out, you have a certain amount of current coming back in. And we use things like a balance choke, which will let that pass uh, because it's going in different directions is not causing a problem. In a balance choke, what will happen is, is that if you have extra <clears throat> current on one side, either in or out, and that switches back and forth, the choke introduces a level of impedance, which really just chokes that out. It stops it from passing through. If you don't do that, what can happen is, is you can get incorrect SWR readings because you're getting extra currents on the outside of your coaxial shield. And that current comes in and then hits your SWR meter and is measured as current, just like it would reflected current. So that's a little bit of a problem. Um, the other thing is, is that when you start to run electrical currents on the outside shield of your coaxial cable, it generates noise. It can pick up noise from other things in your environment. And it can also radiate noise that can cause interference to like TVs and radios and all this other stuff. So it's a really good idea to put chokes, uh, we mentioned earlier, at the feed point of your antenna and then at your, at your radio. It's also a good idea if you're running really long lengths of coax to put one, that what they really say is to put one every quarter wave of the lowest frequency that you intend to operate on. Now I run a hundred feet of coax. I don't have any chokes in the middle of it, but mm -hmm. I do always choke my antennas to feed point. And then I have a choke coming in from the egress point at my house and before the signal comes into my antenna tuner. And Actually, uh, I, just, I, I never, I never thought about, it, but I do also, I have a, uh, the CMCs for my antennas. Yeah. Everything everything coming through that inside the house here. So I think we covered the next one, which was turning your feline into an antenna element. And the other one is, is that some of the CMC can come in and it can cause shocks in the ham shack because you have current that is seeking ground. And, you know, you touch a radio <clears> and you can get a little bit of a bite there. The other thing is, is it can traverse your equipment. So a lot of times what you'll see is somebody operating FT8 on a radio like the ic705 which seems extra susceptible to this 
But when you transmit and your laptop's connected to your 705 via the USB-C cable, a lot of times what will happen is, is that your WSJTX app will freeze up and, and will lose communication with the radio. And what's happening is, is that when you're transmitting, you're getting extra current back on the shield part of your the outer shield of your coaxial cable. It's making its way into the radio and it's looking for a path to ground. And it's taking that USB connection and trying to grind it to ground itself through your laptop connection. So what a lot of folks will do is they'll actually put a choke on that USB cable. I fix mine by using a Wi-Fi app. So I just connect my radio over Wi-Fi, but it's just something to consider there. <laughs> and then it can, I just mentioned, can cause mayhem with other shack equipment. So it can be noise or failures, like your laptop may fail uh, or freeze up. It can cause noise like when your headphones. So like one of the things that uh, all my stuff's connected together through my mixer, and I had to choke my headphone line because I was getting CMC in through my mixer and it was causing some noise when I would transmit. Does the choke go before the remote antenna switch or after the remote antenna switch when it enters in the house? So if you think about your remote, thanks for asking, Don. It's a good question. So if you think about your remote antenna switch, I think I have one sitting around here somewhere. It'll take me too long to find it. But I might have three or four antennas and they're all connected together. And on the switch now, even though you're switching your antenna, uh, the rotator, that's really only switching the center uh, center connector of your coaxial cable. They all have a shared ground. So when common mode current comes in, it is running across that ground and it's looking for a way to come in. Personally, I put them on the antenna feed point as they come into the switch. And I probably would actually stick one after switch. Like I mentioned, I go a little overboard with the chokes, but if you don't choke them before, mine's before. Yes, and if you don't choke them before, that common mode current is going to come in and it's going to run through all of that, uh, that shared ground that you have with that switch. Yeah, that mine goes it. into my, most of my antennas go into my tuner. And then before my tu- before the tuner, I have the uh, the CMC or, or <coughs> yeah, the RA so installed. I have, I, yeah, I have a tuner that has two antennas on it. And I have a choke on each one of those antenna points. Yeah. Okay, I think that one's going to finish up this particular slide. I don't see any other questions in there, but I'm not doing a hey, good job of paying attention. Ape and I've been talking about this a little bit, and, and we're, we're we're thinking about doing Tuesdays, like a half hour at the most. And if you guys are interested in stuff like this, it, it'd be a little bit more technical than we get, and it'll be like on a subject like it is tonight. If you guys like that, put a one in the uh, the chat there. Just kind of let us know if it's worth doing for you guys. That's what we're doing it for. So, <clears throat> and we get yeah, instant gratification tonight if you if you do. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um. Yeah. This is uh like we did the one the other day with my, on my channel. We're gonna switch back and forth, so it'll be one of our two channels here. So, yeah. And we'll try to. It may it may not be every week, but it'll be. So Don say, remember, he has times. a remote antenna switch outside his house. I would definitely put a choke in front of both of the antenna yeah. connections or as many as you have on there on that switch. Yeah. Like I said, I'd probably put one afterwards too. It's not going to hurt anything. Right. This side of the radio is saying 0. 0.5. And we wanted to give a quick shout out to our brothers over at the Ham Radio Clubhouse. Yep. There's one less of them these yep. days. Yeah. Is he good? They, is he done already? I think tonight's his last night. Daniel's last night? Yeah. I had to get over there tonight. Awesome. All um, right. <clears throat> did you have anything else? I think that was the last. Was that the last one? No, I don't. I got a couple. I got a couple more slides. Okay. I don't have anything okay. else on this one. All right. Well, hold on a second. Liberty Cave saying, "What about chokes on coax going out to remote antenna tuners? The ones that you put at the base of your antenna. Does it interfere with the signals on the coax or uh, adjusting the tuner? I would put one in between the antenna tuner and the antenna feed point." Now, depending on how much coaxial cable you have there, I may put one at either line, but I wouldn't put one after the tuner. I would put it all the way back in the shack at the radio uh, feed point at that, at, if that was the case. I don't have a remote antenna tuner, although I want one. I don't have one. And there we go. Uh, Kevin's saying, don't don't burn yourselves out trying to do a show each week. I think what we're talking about is potentially one a month on each channel, so it'd be, two, it'd be yeah. one every two weeks. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> I'm already having enough time trying to figure out what I'm going to do on my nights for cars. Right. Seems like um, every so time the next I turn thing, around. Yeah. 
the next thing we have is using terrible coax cable and coax connectors. And I think what's really important is to understand that not all coax that people call bad is actually bad. So like um, RG8X gets a really bad rap sometimes. Now you'll have a lot of different antenna manufacturers manufacturing what they call RG8X, but maybe it has a shady dielectric in there. Um, some of it might have stranded center conductor. Some of it might have solid center conductor. Some of it might have a good jacket on the outside. Some of it that, that maybe is UV protected. Some of it might not. So you really have to make sure that you're buying the antenna uh, coaxial cable from a, a pretty reputable manufacturer. Don't buy it at the gas station, at this truck stop. Don't buy it at the at the flea market and, and stuff like that. And if you're buying it on eBay, buy it from a reviewed seller. You're probably better off buying it from a ham radio uh, distributor is probably the best way I to use go a, there. I use a lot of AX from ABR. So do I. Never had a pro never had a problem with it. And I think some from DX Engineering. Never had a problem with stuff. Never have a problem yeah. making contacts. I've, I've seen people hook it up and say, oh, look how, how it makes your antenna look so good. And I've not noticed that stuff with the stuff I've bought either. So, Yeah, so I, I would definitely say, you know, be mindful of where you're getting it from. The other one is, is that like, so 8X can get pretty lossy at higher frequencies. So like, I'm not necessarily going right. to run 50 or 100 feet of it if I'm using a 70 centimeter yeah. band or 440. That might want to look right. for a little less lossy coax if I'm doing something there. I did a video about two weeks ago to show how you can use <clears throat> nano VNA to measure loss at particular frequencies of your coaxial cable. And really, it's just a good idea to do that so you understand, like for every dB of loss, it's like 18% of your power, right? So when you get 3 dB loss, you're really looking at half of your power being attenuated. Certain types of coax, I've seen 9 dB of loss. Um, that's like half of half of half um, of your power. Um, it, in UHF and VHF band. So just be mindful of the coax that you're using. And that might be why you're having some problems. Also, uh, bad shields on your coaxial cable can mm -hmm. cause unwanted noise problems where it's picking up interference or picking up RFI from other things that are in your environment. And that noise can raise your noise floor in HF and get you pretty upset. Noise floor isn't really as much of a problem in UHF, VHF, but it is definitely an issue in HF. So you want to make sure you check that. The other one is a lot of times uh, in your like barrel connectors or your adapters or your coaxial cable adapters, they're not made out of the best material and they can suffer right. from wear. They can get spurs on them. You think about fluctuations in temperature, you can get uh, gaps in your connection and you can get grime, grit, moisture in there. Uh, you can get corrosion in there that can mm -hmm. cause you problems. So a lot of times when somebody's having problems with SWR or signal quality or something along those lines, it's a good idea to go out and check all of your connections and make sure that they're, you know, nice and tight that maybe you want to put some electrical tape on them and make sure you keep them moisture and dirt out. You know, that but checking those connectors is a good idea. Yeah. We, 100%. On the OCF, that could be, that could be something out there too. And I've noticed also that the screw on connectors, sometimes you have it, I swear I have it tight and then I come back later and it's not tight. I don't know what goes on sometimes, but like you said, I think if you're going to leave anything out for a long time, make sure you, you tape it good. But uh, at least check, like if you're having problems, I mean, Apes told me a few times, he's like, hey, man, my, my, my SWR is crazy on my antenna. And he goes out and his his long guy has cut his coax again. I mean, how many times now? About 20? I think, I think three. So three. But, uh also, I was running coaxial cable just across the yard. I wasn't. It wasn't buried. It wasn't in conduit or anything like that. And I went out and I was checking it and I could not believe how brittle the jacket had become just from sitting out there and being exposed to the elements. And uh, I was like, man, and I got to tell you, the coaxial cable used to be cheap. <laughs> I know it's expensive, no, it's not. but the price of coaxial cable has gone up in recent years to the point where it's like, yeah. oh my God. So we got a question um, from T Miller and I'm trying to find it. And he's saying, what kind of chokes for... It. Um, you have 400. So one of the things I'll I'm going to tell folks is, is that when you're making uh, some of these, these chokes like we do on the channel, one is, is you can build your choke inside of a little box and then just hook your, your 400 up to either side of the box and you'll be good. The other thing is, is that a lot of times folks will use a cheaper, lower grade coaxial cable for the choke itself. So everybody's going to get worked up. I, I'll use a three foot piece of RG58. Now, normally I wouldn't use RG58 for much. I have used it for jumpers in the shack because it's only a couple feet long and it's not really that big of a deal. 
Right. RG 58 becomes a bigger deal when you're running long stretches of that, like 50 feet, 25 feet, hundred feet. Um, that's where you're really starting to see your loss uh, accumulate for something like a choke. Like I said, I use the three foot length and I get about 11 wraps on a T240 mix 31 toe roid. And um, yeah, the, that's what the problem with the bigger stuff, you're not going to get that many wraps. No. Also that coaxial cable becomes less flexible when you get the bigger stuff. And then what will happen is, is that the center conductor can travel through the dielectric when you try to bend it further than it should be mm -hmm. bent. And that's a no, no. I think we covered environmental <clears throat> damage. Um, then I have one here is impedance mismatch. So poorly made cable might not be 50 ohms, right? It, it, it may have a different impedance to it and that may cause you a problem. And same thing with connectors. Like I've seen where folks have bought 75 ohm BNC connectors as opposed to 50 ohm BNC connectors and had a problem there. And this can cause problems like false SWR readings and things along those lines. So I think that covers that topic pretty well. Yeah, I mean... And there's always that thing, do you do solder on or crimp on? I've gotten to where I just use the crimp ons, but I do solder the center still. And yeah. I, I actually tell you the truth, I like, when you buy them, I like to buy the short ones, the screw on part where there's the threads, because I found mm -hmm. that the uh, longer ones sometimes will, will bottom out on you. And right. a DX, DX Engineering, for a decent price, sells a nice shorter one. And they're crimp ons, and that's where I've been buying mine. I mean, if you, you can buy Apple, Apple and all, <laughs> and they're like, like $10 a piece, but yeah, they're expensive. Some of them are silver plated as well. Right. I mean, if you're really super serious and you're a contest or that might be the way to go. But I think for most people, you just get by with the, the, the a quality one and you can get them, you can get them at the, um, I buy them also at the ham fest at Dayton's a lot of times too. Yeah. Everybody ham jazz. They look, they look good. Yeah, but best place to get connectors, you're going to pay for them, is DX, DX Engineering. Right. Um, Ham Jazz, who's our good buddy, he's saying that, uh, question, are BNC more susceptible to weather than PL259? Yeah, for I sure. So, so you can actually just look at BNC connectors and see gaps in them. So they're great <laughs> in shack, but out in the wild, you definitely want to do something. I think they're, they're more susceptible when you're moving things around, too. If your cable gets yeah. moved around. I watched my 705, that the SWR, I think, connect. just totally change. Yeah. There was another question in here, and I'm looking mm, for it. I've been trying they, to find them, but they didn't put in question at the beginning of it, and I don't see it now. Oh, Liberty Cave was asking if Snap One Ferrite chokes work. It, they do, and a lot of people say, "Well, you have the split and the bead and all that stuff. They'll work. They don't work as well as a Raptoroid, though." It, and they so, need to be tight still, though, too, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to. You so, don't want to put a. A half inch one on after you know and, and i think our, our thing eight. is use what you have so if that's what you have use it if you haven't bought anything yet <clears throat> buy a toroid right. hoa was asking if we were gonna come out with chokes we've ape and i've done it i've built a couple little choke boxes and we just it's just a matter of time for us to get that kind of stuff out it's um it's a cost thing more than anything else we can, and a time thing too, right? Because we test the heck thing. out of everything and we want to make sure if it's a kit that it's easy to build and all that. Plus the yeah. support questions that we get, it's just a, it's just a time thing. Even, even our infant halfways, we tested those long, uh, long before we actually put any out on the market. Yeah. Even though it's a time. proven design, you know? So we got Richie we radio wanna... room. Hey, thank Richie, you very thank much you. for the super sticker. Much appreciated. But yeah, so when we, we, I mean, we tested out the, and a lot of people give us grief, uh, you know, supposed antenna experts are like, well, why do you use the 16 gauge <laughs> magnet wire on it? Because it worked the best in all the testing that we've done, which was extensive. And then we got a lot of grief from people saying, well, why did you use the silicon coated stranded wire for the, you know, all this stuff. And again, it's what we tested and worked well. Yeah. So the point is, is that we, we, when we went to Dayton last year, we, we had <clears> manufacturers <throat> coming up to us talking about how they're going to start integrating the silicon wire yeah, using their designs. Exactly. Using the, a big, a big <laughs> distributor. Right. Maybe not right. the biggest one, but probably the second biggest one. I told him I wanted my taste. I was like, if you're going to That's do that, right. I need to be kind of a piece of the action over here. Yeah. It was, it was kind of cool that they, they knew who we were and, and they were actually watching what we were using. So. Yeah, I found that funny because like I was talking to to a guy who was in a big radio company, and um, he was like, "He's like, what's your name again?" And I said, "Well, look, man, I you know I go by the Smoke and Ape and all this stuff." And he goes, "Oh no, 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 I know who you are." And I was like, "What?" You know, I just 
<laughs> never, never expected that. But, um, All right. It's a humbling thing, you know, but whatever. All right. Bad antenna location. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about, did you mount your antenna in a bad spot? When you start to look for a place where you're going to mount your antenna, the first thing is before you even buy, build an antenna, have your buddy build you one, whatever, do a survey of where you think you're going to mount that in your yard. Do you have enough space? If you're going to do a vertical, do you have enough space for the radials? And if you don't, how are you going to lay those things out? How are you going to run your coax? Are you going to have coax looped all over the place? Can you get a shorter coax run so you have less loss? How are you going to ground your, your antenna uh, system? They're all things to think about, but also when in your antenna, when it radiates, you have a near field and your far field. The near field is where you have a lot of chaos of radiation coming off of your antenna and it's bouncing off things. It's bouncing off of other signals coming off of your antenna and it's sorting itself out until you get your far field pattern formation. And that typically takes about a quarter of a half of a wave of the frequency that you're working on in order for that to happen. So we can manipulate and control this a little bit with things like directors and reflectors and ground planes and, and stuff like that. But if you think about it, if you have old cars like your, you know, your 86 Skylark sitting in the backyard, big old propane tank or a swing set, that all has metal that is reactive and that will cause deformation of your near field, which will then cause deformation of your far field and your takeoff angle. So your takeoff angle is where your antenna is the strongest as it sends signals up to the ionosphere to be refracted back. And so you really want to make sure that you pay attention to things that are around your antenna that could be causing you grief. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Like I saw where a guy had uh, a, a metal fence right underneath of his antenna and he's like, hey, I'm hoping it helps with radiation. I don't really know because I don't have a a, a meter to measure that a field strength meter and you go, but you know, you, you, you use what you have, but you may have choices. And if you do a survey, it might help you out a little bit. Um, another bad location is if you mount it in between houses or buildings, right? So you want to make sure that your antenna is out in the open and is structure free as possible in any angle that you're going to be radiating, radiating. Another one is attics and basements. And so you see a lot of hams will tell you, hey, I have an antenna in my attic and it works great. Well, if you have an older house that has a slate and a wood roof, you're probably just fine. A lot of these newer houses have that, uh, what is it called, Chuck, that Trevex stuff that's like aluminum lined insulation. You know, some of the... Some oh, of those, on the roofs, you mean? Yeah, well, you can have it on the sides under, of your house, un, Like in the eaves well, or whatever. I, I, I don't know how you guys are... In Nebraska, but here in California, they're starting to do like a, a, a aluminized plywood, like the top of it's aluminum to reflect right. the heat and stuff now. So, I mean, all that stuff can start. I mean, metal is usually not too bad, like, like especially for verticals, but uh, it can it can affect things. Metal buildings, you know, you put your antenna next to a metal building and it may just throw your, ton your you know, everything off. We, yeah. we don't have any, I don't know of any siding that's metal, but well, you have the aluminum siding. Well, like that, that, before. that insulative material or board or whatever it is that will have like a... Oh, it has like a, a foil? Yes, yes. That's it's, what I'm dimpled, about. it's dimpled. I know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So let's take yeah. a quick break to answer this question real quick. Um, another one too. <clears throat> Scott just got says, what is your recommended and fed halfway configuration and length? So I pretty much operate on 40 and higher because of space limitations. So I usually go with around a 62 to 64 foot element and then a 17 yeah. foot counterpoise, give or take. And I'll tailor that to wherever I have it mounted or used. When you get like an 80 foot, 80 meter um, and fed half wave, the 80 meter or 75 meter band, depending on how old you are, is how you refer to it, um, is very big in size. And the NFED mm -hmm. half wave works off <clears throat> of harmonic relationships between the amateur radio bands. So you could have an 80 meter NFED half wave that's tuned so that its harmonic uh, uh, fre related frequencies are actually outside of 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter bands. So if you do build an 80 meter NFED half wave, usually you have to put some kind of compensation coil either close to the antenna feed point or close to the end of your element. Chuck, I don't know if you yeah, have a take on that. Um, well, I've used a, I used it. It was like 130 feet. It's a lot of wire in the air, man. 
I, yeah, I tell you, I, I took it out. I took mine out for for field day one time, and it almost broke my the, my mask because <laughs> it was so long. I'm like oh, this wasn't very smart because it was actually pretty decent sized wire and everything too. Chris had another question here for you too. This I think is more towards your VNA. He says that he thinks he has interference that's causing his 891 on FT8 to go fuzzy. Do you have any videos with your VNA to how to find <clears throat> interference sources? So that's a that's a little bit more difficult. W what you can do is you can use your tiny SA spectrum analyzer and put a whip antenna. It actually comes with one. And then you can actually just narrow down the span on your, on your screen for your spectrum analyzer and then hold it in your hand and walk around and you can look for RF uh, noise sources that way that the nano VNA won't, won't pick that up. <coughs> Brent had to get out of here. He'll still catch us later. Replay. Yeah. And they're saying radiant barrier is what was called that material that I was oh, trying to think of and I couldn't. Yeah. That's all that stuff came after my, my construction days. Or, or Tyvek. I, I know what you're yeah. talking about now. Well, Tyvek was like is a, a Trivic uh, or something like that. Yeah. Tyvek. Tyvek is a water, like a waterproof membrane. It's not metallic though. It's so a brand name actually. Yeah, the other thing is, is that basements, and, and shockingly, I've actually had people give me a call, not a call, more like a direct message, and say things like, hey, I'm having problems, can you help me out? And we just kind of talk about how they're using their radio and where their antenna is, and it's in the basement. And I'm like, well, the problem is, is that your, your antenna is below ground. And so you probably want to think about running it outside and running a wire inside or something along those lines, but that's probably not going to help you out. Now, that's more of a UHF, VHF type scenario where I've seen that happen. I don't know anybody who's run HF antennas in the basement, but it might be out there. Well, it's, I mean, kind of like a, a lot of people run them in attics and stuff. Yeah. It, the, um, the last thing I had on here is poor ground. So where you live, most of the ground in the United States is not good conductive ground that works well for amateur radio. So you have a lot of people putting in artificial ground planes, uh, radials, and so in some cases they even put down material in their yard to, to get the, the earth to be more conductive. Now, I don't think you should go sprinkling salt around in your yard or any of that kind of stuff, but some people do it. Um, but it's something that you definitely sure. want to, yeah, you, de you definitely want to consider. Um, and you can look at the USGS uh, website, it's United States Geological Services. And there's a good chance that somebody has done ground surveys in your area so you can understand the, co the conductivity of your ground. So when you do antenna modeling, you can actually put that type that you can put the um, the readings that they have into the, your modeling software and get an idea of how your antenna is going to work or how it's not going to work. And then you can see if that is consistent with what you're noticing when you're operating. They're asking about putting mercury and maybe lead and mercury mixed with, with pee. People are saying, what if they pee in the yard? You know, pee's conductive, I think. So it might help you out. I don't know. Yeah. I, somebody was, they're talking about cutting coax. If you guys can find these things, th these are, these were from Sears, Craftsman's. Basically what dangerous. it is, what it is basically is a, uh, it's a razor blade that you can replace. And if you guys know, when you cut coax, it usually squishes it. This stuff cuts it so clean, it doesn't even squish it. It's, it's amazing. I just I just tried it one day, and it's like really good. I don't know if you can still buy it. There's other companies that made them too. It's just it's just a big razor blade. That's what it is. That looks like some kind of medieval torture device, Jug. Like a finger chopper. Could have been at one time. That might be where they got it. They may have got it from. All right. That's the best thing I found because I bought cutters for that, and I ended up using those. That was the that was the last slide that I had in there. So uh, apologies, mm -hmm. everybody, for not paying close attention to the to the chat because I was trying to I was I'm trying still, to trying to catch most of them. But um, you know, if there's any questions, though, most. still got a few minutes. Just make sure you put the word question in there. <laughs> I, I don't have my glasses on, and even if I did, I, <laughs> I could. Or, or if you or if you, uh, you if you actually at. It really works good if you do the at like ape or at me. That way we yeah. Can pop Pops it up for us. We can see it. it. Puts it in like a red. Makes right. it easier to see. When I first when I first got into ham radio, I thought the guys were just being nice. They were like like moving my channel along for me. And then I finally figured out that oh, that's not what that was. I <laughs> thought way too much here. of some of the big channels. Let me tell you. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Much appreciated, bro. Oh, Bill's here, huh? He is. He was here. I he, I saw him. I saw his <clears> comment <throat> earlier in there. 
I'll see. Well, I may see Bill here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, is he going to be at uh, in Florida? I think I think he's going to be there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to make not it. Flo to not Florida. No, not Florida. Arizona. Oh, Arizona. Right, right, right. And then Rodney's got a question here, and he's saying, for finding RFI, they can also use an old AM radio. Yep, that's absolutely true, mm -hmm. and it's a good. It's a good idea. That's what I've done. Yeah, it helps. And then Don, I don't know if he's joking around or not. Building the choke for QRO, how do we figure out the size that we need? So <clears throat> a choke is different than an, an un, un because an un, un is doing a impedance transformation. A choke is introducing impedance to choke out um, your common mode current. And so you can get away with a much, much smaller choke than you would if you were use, if you were building like a 49 to one for QRO, you would need a much bigger core for the 49 to one, a much smaller core for the, the choke. If I was operating QRO, and when you say QRO, I mean real QRO, like 750 to a gallon to, to a gallon and a half, I would probably use stack T240 mix 31 cores, two or three of them, just because I am overbuild everything, just because I, I don't want to have to do it twice. I'm, answer, I'm answering uh, other Andy here, but I'm not sure which. Here we go. Fifth smokes. It was too small. <laughs> I, I don't know which uh, rotor he was talking about. Actually, rotator, rotor, rotor. I, I, I don't know if maybe he's talking about my 12 holder. But uh, my my no, normal one up on my uh, up on my uh, tower works, is working fine. I did have to fix something one time. So I would try to get it as far away as you can. So again, the stuff that we went through on the slide deck are best practices and recommendations. So I'm sure that if you went to anybody's ham shack location and you went through that checklist <laughs> of a presentation that we put together, you're going to find violations somewhere along the line. So I would say get it as far away as you can and be done with it. And if, if you have a problem that you notice, then you might want to talk about fixing it. But I'll tell you something. So our, our good buddy, Jim, FEP labs was telling us the other day that when he was transmitting, I can't remember the frequency FT8, his all-star node, which is using a two meter J pole that's in his near field was keying up. So <laughs> he would sit there and his HT would go off because the R-star also node was, was keying up because of currents that it was picking up from his HF transmission. Air so he's got to move his, he's got to move sure. his J pole. Oh, what's the J pole? Uh, Andy was asking about my 12 volt rotor, and I, I actually have I bought the biggest expensive part of making a newer one that's like way more powerful. Just when I get around to actually doing the video and stuff, and and cutting so, uh, up a very expensive uh, screw gun. Joseph Richard saying that he just got his tech license. Congratulations! That's awesome. Congratulations, man. Joseph. He's talking around the world on 10 meters. And I tell you what, right now is the time to do it because we're at the getting ready to hit the peak of the solar cycle and 10 meters is on, is on fire most days when we're not getting a flare. And he's using a striker uh, um, CB antenna with the 7300. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, man. Glad to hear Chuck has got a video out where he has used modified CB antennas to be successful on 10 meters. Tell him about it, Chuck. Yeah. Well, I did one on the Antron 99 or A9, A99. Antron was the original name. I think that um, antenna is making a comeback. Yeah. All, all of a sudden it's making a comeback. Yeah. Um, for people that don't even know what it was, but anyhow, um, I actually have, he, what was he talking about? He's talking about the, uh, the, the, the striker. striker. I have a, I have a serial. Um, I thought about throwing that thing on and, and throw my radio out there and do some 10 meter. I've got an 11 meter serial antenna. And I had never put an antenna on my vehicle for CB that worked as good as that thing did. It was it was amazing. It was like I used to have K40s and the Wilsons. The Wilson, the last Wilson I bought, I don't think they're what they used to be back in the 70s. I couldn't get the thing to tune. Well, they're probably making it in China on. now. Well, I threw this one on and it was perfect. Those are all that stuff's made out of uh, Italy, I guess. Supposedly, well, it's designed there at least. Um, but I thought about, I've, I've got the mount on my truck. I just got to find the antenna. I think it's sitting over here in the room. And I, I think I'll go out and when 10 meters kind of open one day, I'll go out and set up on a hill someplace and in my truck and make some contact with it. Maybe I'll video that. But, uh, and I've I also think with got that, we're going to, oh, go ahead. I've, oh, well, I've got another antenna that's, it's a, the, the one I was talking about earlier was a base antenna, the A99. And I've got another base antenna that I think I'm going to throw up 
similar antenna, better antenna, I think, than the A99. I mean, cause I've, I've seen people say this is the best antenna ever. A99 was, was a decent antenna that was easy to set up. It wasn't <laughs> like the best antenna out there. It was very popular, though. Great antennas, but not, I wouldn't say the best. So polarizing statements by Chuck. And with that, I think we're going to end the show. We don't want to step on our friends over at the Ham Radio Clubhouse. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for the super yeah, chat. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for participating. Rodney, and Rodney, you're correct. You're having a good time tonight. Thank you. The and I hit the button. 